Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at some of the guns that they are going to be selling in their upcoming September of 2017 Premier Auction. And today we're taking a look at a Remington Keen. Now, I actually looked at another Remington Keen many years ago, and I figured it was about time to do a little bit better video on one of these, because there's a bunch of information that I left out of the last one. So this is a Navy pattern of Remington Keen, although it, as far as I can tell, does not bear the actual approval marks that would make it a, a, an actual Navy purchase gun. Um, but let's start a little farther back. This was developed by a guy named John W. Keen. Uh, he started putting together the idea in the early 1870s, and by 1877 he had the design pretty much done. He had acquired nine different patents uh, involved in it, in the time being, in, the, in that process. And he needed a manufacturer. You know, he was just an inventor, he put together the design, but he didn't have the facilities to manufacture these things. However, the Remington Company did. And Remington happened to know that the US military was setting up a uh, magazine rifle board in 1878, and they were going to be looking for possibilities for a magazine-fed rifle to replace the trapdoor Springfield. Well, Remington had been putting all of its energy, or the great majority of its energy, into its rolling block rifles. Those were extremely popular, they made a ton of money for Remington, um, used by military forces around the world. But it meant that Remington didn't actually have a design for a bolt-action, or a magazine-fed repeating rifle of its own, and they needed one quick. Well, it's easy enough, let's go find someone who's got a rifle and needs a manufacturer. Presto, John Keen, meet Remington Company. Remington made a number of prototypes of these, submitted them to the Army Board in 1878, and was promptly rejected. Now, if it helps them at all, you know, the Army didn't really adopt any magazine-fed rifle as a result of that trial. Um, they came to the conclusion that the Winchester Hotchkiss was a bit better, um, but rejected everything else. Uh, the Navy had been paying attention to this trial, and the Navy also wanted a repeating rifle. In fact, the Navy kind of wanted one a little bit more. So the Navy actually purchased... well, they purchased a whole bunch of Hotchkiss rifles, and then they also purchased some Lee pattern rifles with detachable magazines, and they purchased 250 of these uh, Remington Keen rifles, which have a magazine underneath the barrel. The Navy was actually interested in testing out these three different types of magazine. Uh, under the barrel here, detachable box from the Lee, and the Hotchkiss, which had a tube magazine in the buttstock. And they did some testing, and they came to the conclusion that this worked just fine. Um, however, they didn't feel it was any better than their Hotchkiss rifles, so they didn't order any further guns. Uh, these would end up staying in use on the USS Michigan and the USS Trenton until at least 1888. Possibly longer, but I don't have any documentation to say for sure. Um, and that was the extent of the US military use of this rifle, unfortunately for Remington. Obviously they'd been hoping for a big major purchase and adoption by the Army. Since they didn't get that, in 1880 they released this on the commercial market in a number of different configurations. They had carbines, they had this navy length rifle, which is like a 29 and a quarter inch barrel, they had an army pattern rifle, which was a 32 and a half inch barrel. Uh, both this and the army rifle had a magazine capacity of nine rounds in the tube, plus one in the chamber, um, and that was of standard pattern 4570 government cartridges. So that's 10 rounds of 4570 is really quite a lot of firepower. Um, it was seven rounds plus one in the chamber for the carbines. And they did also offer it, I should say, in 4060 and 43 Spanish, but the vast majority of purchases were 4570. These would prove to be reasonably popular rifles on the American frontier, because that's a lot of a lot of firepower in a bolt-action rifle like this. The one other purchase, government purchase of note of Remington Keynes was about 600 rifles purchased by the U.S. Interior Department, and marked USID, uh, for use by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, they were issued out to Indian agents and Indian police uh, forces on the reservations. So those are interesting. They're a little short carbine pattern with a half-length stock and a full-length magazine tube. In retrospect, it really seems clear that if it hadn't been for Keen, someone else would have come up with a rifle of this sort of type. Uh, this was developed during the 1870s, when Winchester was doing a really good job of uh, promoting and popularizing the underbarrel tube magazine as a, uh, a magazine designed for repeating rifles. However, none of Winchester's offerings were available in the 4570 government cartridge. 
uh, which seems like a bit of an oversight, but the toggle system that Winchester was using wasn't quite up to, uh, up to a cartridge of that power. Plus some other reasons as well, which by the way I get into in my series on the Winchester lever actions. What Keane did was combine the, the well-proven underbarrel magazine with the also well-proven uh, single locking lug bolt action. This is very similar to uh, the French chassepot, uh, the way that it locks, as well as a number of other rifles at the time. The, we cringe at a, the idea of a single locking lug today, but with black powder cartridge pressures that was perfectly adequate. Then to really seal the deal for the time period, Keane put in this hammer that isn't actually a hammer. This is actually a striker fired rifle, very much like a typical traditional bolt action rifle but he gave it a hammer-shaped cocking piece. And this was partly for the military trials. Knowing that we had, the US had a pretty conservative military establishment, figured that this would make uh, a lot of those officers more comfortable with the gun. Because this is a cocking indicator, it functions for practical matter like a hammer. When it's cocked back like this, the rifle is cocked and ready to fire. If this piece is all the way forward, the rifle is safe, because it can't fire. So at a glance, an officer can tell the status of the rifle of any one of his troops in a line, just by looking at it. Um, there is also a half-cock notch, by the way, there, which is more safe. Uh, prevents the thing from firing should you hit the back of the, the cocking piece while it's all the way down. Uh, at any rate, that didn't end up working for them uh, in the military trials. That wasn't sufficient. But it remained on the commercial guns. And one of the interesting side notes of this is, of course, after you fire, this drops. And then when you cycle the bolt, it does not actually recock the rifle. It just puts it in that safety notch. So it's a two-part process to cycle this. You have to run the bolt to load a new cartridge, and then you have to manually finish cocking the rifle. If we look down inside the action, we will see an elevator style of mechanism. Um, it's pretty typical of lever actions. This is very similar to the Lebel or the Kropacek. And when you pull the bolt all the way back, that elevator is going to lift up. It'll bring a cartridge with it. And then when you push the bolt forward, it will push that cartridge into the chamber. And then when you close the bolt, it pushes this little lever down, which is going to drop the elevator. There it is. You heard that drop now. The elevator's at its bottom position where spring pressure from the magazine spring in there will push the next cartridge out onto the elevator, so that when you open it again, you have another round ready to feed. Unlike the Winchester, which had a loading gate on the side, this thing fed a particularly long cartridge. So uh, what Keane did was a kind of clever way of, of doing this. The, the bottom of the elevator is visible on the bottom of the rifle. And like you would look at a, a normal pump action shotgun today, you just push this up and you have access to load cartridges into the magazine tube. So just like a Winchester, you can top this off basically while you're firing. Note that when I open the bolt, that elevator goes up, just like when I'm loading it. Disassembly is really slick and easy with one catch. And that catch is why the disassembly screw on this rifle is really beaten up. For some reason, and I don't know why, uh, Remington made this a left-hand thread screw. So somebody spent a lot of time and effort really trying to unscrew this and actually just tightening it. So in order to unscrew it, we are actually going to thread it backwards. When you do this, uh, the follower here, the, el the elevator, is going to drop down below the level of the stock when I pull this screw out. So you can see that this has dropped down. And then for disassembly, all we have to do is open the bolt and pull it right out the back. When you look at the bolt outside of the rifle, you can see that it clearly is a typical striker-fired mechanism. So your sear is right up here. Uh, when the gun is actually fired, the bolt handle is down. And at that point, with the, the cocking piece all the way forward, the firing pin protrudes through. If you have this in its... well, I can't put it in its safety notch because that requires hooking this into the sear in the rifle. But uh, when it's in the safety notch, the firing pin is retracted far enough that it won't fire. Uh, also, I should point out, when this bolt is fully locked, it's not actually 90 degrees flat. It's slightly elevated, kind of like a Berdan rifle, and that's intentional. So looking at this offhand, some people might think that the, the bolt's coming slightly out of battery. But no, 
that's how it's supposed to be. Reassembly is very simple. Just slide the bolt back in, and then if you look through there you can kind of see that the bits aren't entirely lined up inside, but this screw has a really nice uh, tapered angle to it at the front. And all you have to do is put it in there and screw it in, which by the way is backwards because it's left hand thread. These would stay in production until 1888, uh, so about, well, eight years on the commercial market, a total of about 5,000 sold. This wasn't a, uh, you know, a rollicking success for Remington, but it wasn't a failure either. Um, they made decent money on this rifle, and it allowed them to have an entry into uh, that bolt action or, or magazine rifle competition in 1878. So overall, not a bad show, Mr. Keene. A couple other things to point out. There is a cleaning rod uh, built into these uh, military pattern versions of the Remington Keene, and it's located on the side of the stock, which is necessitated because the tube magazine is running down the center of the stock, so you don't have room for it there. So they slid it in the side, much like a Berthier. The rear sight here is kind of typical of this period. It has just an incredibly tiny uh, little notch sight back here. Um, in fact, if I flip that up, you can't even really see it. There we go. If I put my hand behind it for some contrast, right at the bottom of that curve in there, there's a little tiny notch. That's what you get for a rear sight. And one other feature I'm sure calculated to hopefully get Army support is this, this uh, cartridge cutoff. So in the rearward position it doesn't feed from the magazine, and in the forward position it does. The idea here of course is that you can have the magazine loaded and then fire slowly, single shot at a time, until uh, some emergency calls for use of the magazine, and then you can flip this and have a whole bunch of rounds all at once. One other interesting little mechanical note that's just kind of cool here is how the elevator is actually locked in the upward position. It has a little spring-loaded catch, and there's a peg right here in the receiver. And when the elevator comes up, you can see that that catch snaps back and locks onto the peg. So when the bolt comes forward, all it has to do is pop that off of the peg and the elevator will drop. Um, it's under spring tension to go down all the time. So that's kind of cool. Now in terms of markings, there should be a three-line uh, Remington address manufacturer's mark here on the back of the bolt. However, it appears to be worn off on this particular gun, and there are no other markings in the metal on this one, so some of its origin is a little bit of a mystery. There is this one marking, uh, pretty deeply uh, stamped into the stock, uh, 406 and then C8. And that doesn't conform to any formal marking I'm aware of. I have no idea what that actually means. This particular example has a few questions to it. Um, the markings are worn off the back, um, and there, are no, there aren't any martial markings on the barrel. Um, although if they're worn off the back, maybe they were worn off the barrel too. There is quite a lot of finish wear on here. Um, and then there's that interesting weird mark on the stock. I have no particular idea what that was for. Um, I think it's unlikely that this was actually a Navy purchase rifle, especially given that Remington did offer the Navy pattern as a commercial option. So I think someone probably bought that. Can't explain where that mark on the stock came from or what its significance is. But if you would like to have this one uh, as a cool example of a US military pattern rifle, uh, from this period. Well, take a look at the description text below the video. You'll find a link there to Rock Island's catalog page on this rifle. That'll have their pictures, their description, their price estimates, and uh, all that sort of information. And you can place a bid on it if you like, over the phone, through the web, or live here at the auction in person. Thanks for watching.